everyone. Thanks for thanks for joining uh, this uh, webinar thing. Um, you're about to get a demonstration <clears throat> of a full cloud collection uh, and analysis pipeline tool uh, for Google Cloud Platform. Um, it can also work on other platforms as well, but we'll showcase it on Google Cloud Platform. Uh, and we'll also see how to manage um, that data and merge it with like other forensic data that does not come from the cloud. So you're going to hear a story, an exciting story about a forensic investigation uh, made by a university. Uh, this is all uh, fake, by the way. Uh, there's a lot of buzzwords like IoT, cloud, cyber, blockchain, DevOps. It's going to be it's going to be pretty cool. Strap in. A little bit about me. Uh, my name is Thomas. Um, I'm an intern responder for Google. Uh, I'm the DF Time Wolf core developer, uh, and I'm based in Zurich, Switzerland. Um, so yeah, I'm on Twitter. I'm not very active, but I I will occasionally have hot takes on things. So uh, yeah, that's that's it for me. I usually make this presentation with uh, Daniel, who is a coworker of mine, but he is not here today. Um, so before we get uh, into this, maybe a small clarification. This is a story. We invented it. All the infrastructure here has been invented and set up by us. Um, mm. I have to say this because we've gotten questions in previous talks um, about how um, if we got permission from the entities. No, no, no. There's no permission. This is all a story. It's made up. Um, we have some characters as any good story. So it all comes uh, from the Greendale Polytechnic Institute which is a for-profit education institute in Zurich. Uh, again, this is this is fake. Um, but they specialize in teaching uh, air conditioning, and they hope to bring uh, the technology of air conditioning to, um, to Switzerland. They've had a few setbacks in the past, um, having faced attackers um, that want to steal all their information about um, air conditioning. Um, and they've been in touch with this other company that I'm going to talk about later. But here is uh, the main cast of characters. So the dean, the dean of the school, who also does some sysadmin stuff, uh, you know, and on his free time, what can possibly go wrong there? And we also have Benjamin Chang, who is a recently graduated cloud expert. <clears throat> and he has to set up uh, the cloud infrastructure for Greendale's uh, new class on IoT and uh, air conditioning. On the other side, on the response on side, we have cyber forensics affordances. So these are the people who have worked with Greendale in the past uh, on a very uh, different set of incidents that they've had. Um, we have Ahmed, who's a very uh, experienced incident responder. Uh, he knows pretty well. And they have a new hire, Rosa, uh, which is a new addition to them. And she is a very quick learner. And she's going to be the one who does most of the investigation here. Uh, Ahmed is mentoring Rosa so that she can learn the ropes a bit better. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, Ben Chang joined Greendale as a cloud expert, and his main job is to set up a cloud infrastructure uh, on Greendale's uh, IoT systems. So when he's doing some routine checks, he sees uh, a few cloud alerts uh, like this, a billing alert. So it's basically your money flying away. Uh, all this, the, the, the graph that you see here is uh, mostly CPU usage for different types of uh, instances that are running in uh, GCE, which is the, the service that runs the virtual machines in the cloud. And as you can see, all this, all these new instances are spiking uh, 2% uh, of CPU usage, which is really not that great um, as an indication of something. It's a good indication that something's pretty off. So he digs a bit deeper and sees there's a bunch of instances that are called instance-6, dash dash five, something. And they're all using a lot of uh, CPU power. So he thinks he, he's not he's not the one who did this. So he calls Ahmed at CFA to try and figure out um, what is going on. So Greendale has never been great about keeping CFA in the loop about their new infrastructure. Um, and this is the first time Ahmed has ever heard that they were moving to the cloud. But fortunately for for Ahmed and CFA, they have already a bunch of clients in the cloud, so they kind of know how to articulate a response around this. So Ahmed know that he wants um, a time sketch instance ready to ingest plaza files. Um, so I think this is a good time to mention that if you have any questions, uh, just throw them in the chat 
it has it is there's a small window open next to the presentation slide so i'll try to keep an eye on them and try to answer any questions that you have uh, as we go uh, so time shift is um an analysis tool that allows you to visualize different types of timelines uh, that you get from systems so these are forensic timelines indicating like changes in the file system or other events that are logged um in a good way and this is what most of my demos today will be about um, there's also a Turbinia instance that he wants, that Ahmed wants. Turbinia is um, a, an orchestration framework that works in the cloud. So basically, it takes in evidence, uh, runs a bunch of workers on that evidence. One of the workers is the tool that is going to produce the timeline that TimeSketch is going to use. Uh, that tool is called Plazo or Log to Timeline. Uh, if you've done forensics, you've probably heard of it before. Um, so. We want a Turbinia instance working with a bunch of workers already ready to run jobs, other types of jobs like strings, extractions, and so on. We're going to focus on the Plaza job this time around. And we also want a Time Wolf, a DF Time Wolf client set up and ready to go. So DF Time Wolf is basically what is going to allow Turbinia and Time Sketch to talk to each other. Um, it's like the duct tape that uh, connects all our forensics tools together when in scenarios where they can't talk directly to each other. So this is very complicated to set up in a, during an incident. So fortunately, we also have Terraform scripts that allow um, that allow to obviously set up this infrastructure. And there's a quick video of how that looks. So the Terraform scripts is included in an open source project called Forseti. Um, so this is what, what is going to happen here. We just go to the Forseti uh, incident response infrastructure directory. We initialize the Terraform uh, setup. Going to do a bunch of processing. And then we just Terraform apply within this directory. Uh, and this is going to start um, all the setup given a few entry values like, you know, the project name that you want it on. Um, it's going to print a bunch of information like do you want this to happen and you say yes and then it's going to create all the instances and the service and you can see the turbinia module is executing and the instances are automatically being created um and everything is pre-set up so that it works correctly uh and is all integrated we can see the time script server as well being set up and so on these are the instances that we have. We have the Elasticsearch nodes that are used by TimeSketch. So this is all abstracted. You don't have to, you, you really don't have to dabble into anything. It's all just two commands and you have everything going on. All right, so once Ahmed has set this up, um, he also needs information to input and to intake into TimeSketch. So the first that he wants to do is get some stack driver logs because this is probably where he'll get the most information out of uh, what happened in cloud. Stackdriver is uh, GCP's uh, logging mechanism, logging product. And DF TimeWolf has a very um, handy uh, recipe for this. So recipes in TimeWolf are a set of modules that are chained to each other. Um, so basically, in this case, you can kind of deduce from the recipe name that is the second parameter in this command line. So it's going to take Stackdriver GCE logs and send them to TimeSketch. Uh, and then it takes a few parameters like what projects you want the logs from, uh, a start date and an end date for the project, and any justification uh, for that, you know, uh, acquisition in case you have a system that records it. Um, so yeah, this is this is exactly what's going on. And I have a time sketch instance ready to go if my browser doesn't crash. Um, Switching tabs is apparently hard. All right, there we go. I I think everyone can see the sketch. I have the I have a very tiny preview of the of the things. If text is too small or too large, please let me know and I can adjust um, things as we go. So this is what time sketch looks like. Refresh this. Um, so this is basically uh, these are spoilers, but this. Stack driver logs are in pink, and you can see there's a bunch of entries here. We're going to see a bit more specifically what we're looking for. Uh, so in this case, what we want is um, trying to see which. Um, uh, hold on. What we want is try to see which what happened with uh, 
insertions in the VMs of our cloud. So this is a pre can query, but I'm going to explain how it works. So basically what you have here is <clears throat> a query that is going to select a field on an event, which is the method name here. Uh, and then you can say, tell it like, I want give me all the events where the method name is V1 compute instances insert. Of course, there's no pre hand way to do this because it really depends on uh, the kind of events that you're ingesting. An event, as far as time sketch is concerned, is a thing that has happened on the system or the logs that you're working on. So if you see here, for example, you can see that there's um, uh, hang on. maybe more events will be useful. There's a bunch of events here that are indented. And as we can see, um, the insertion happens here. This is the method name, and this is what we're selecting events on. Uh, we have other information, such as the project name. And the information that you see here is really not dependent on time sketch. Time sketch is just going to parse whatever it ingests. So in this case, this information is obtained through um, the stack driver logs that we're interested in. And as we can see, um, the email or the account that was responsible for these insertions, and these insertions happen, there's a lot of them. Uh, these are all insertions that are happening in, in the system. And we can see it comes from this super admin account um, in, um, in, the, in the GCE console. So, you know, Ahmed sees this. Uh, well, this is a service account, so it's probably used by robots. It's kind of like an API key. Um, and so Ahmed has a kind of hunch and he thinks this is probably a bot that is doing this. So he does a Google search and he finds that, oh, well, yes, we can see that the Dean has pushed a private key <clears throat> to his GitHub account. And so probably a robot just stumbled upon it and uh, abused the key to spin up the instances. Nothing to worry about here. Uh, it's really not that serious. Just, you know, remove the instances. And, um, and you know, you can close the incident. But Ahmed is still going to give uh, Rosa some time to explore uh, a little bit more things. And so what Rosa does, because this is Rosa taking over, she's going to remove this insert thing. And she wants to see what else happened um, on uh, the, the GCP projects um, around the time where the instances were created. And so you see the instances were all created on October 7th, but on October 4th, a very interesting thing happens. I've pre-highlighted these events because it's the one I'm interested in. But we can see that there's a set metadata call and then a reset call on the Jenkins instance. And Rosa knows that uh, set metadata can be used to pick startup scripts uh, in your instance. So you can set up instances uh, and set a metadata startup script, and this script will be executed uh, once the computer boots. Um, so one could argue that this is a good way to describe fileless malware in a way. Um, and so, yeah, setting the data and resetting the, the VM right after really sounds like someone is trying to establish persistence. Uh, but it's still probably fine. Let's see if we can dig a little deeper on, on what's going on here. So if we see the user agent that did this, um, we see that this is Cloud SDK with the gcloud command line, and it's on Linux Microsoft, which is unusual because Rosa knows that Ben Chang, who is at the who is the the owner account the account owner that did this, she knows that it's a little um, a little he's not he's not a, a Linux nerd, so he's more he he uses the UI more. And if we go up again and try to figure out another um, another um, if we look at all the events that Cheng did, um, maybe we can find the user agent that uh, he usually uses. Uh, and we see it's usually Mozilla Firewall, so Firefox. So this is this is a bit a bit weird. Um, she really uh, it's Chrome basically. Sorry, not Mozilla. Uh, so she kind of wants to get her hands on the startup script uh, just to see what's going on, right? Um, and so she there's a handy gcloud command that you can use for that. Uh, which will just interact with the API and get you the script. And this is what the script looks like, which is a little um, very suspicious uh, in a way. 
base64 encoding in a starter script. Why would any legit thing do that? This is weird. So she codes the script and she sees this. And you know, this is really bad because it's a very suspicious thing being dropped in SSHD, which is really not the normal uh, path where SSHD is supposed to live. And also there's a command that gets what, what we assume is a binary from grendale.xyz. So there's a type of squatting on the real Greendale domain. So very suspicious, very bad. Uh, Rosa definitely thinks that we need more evidence for this. Um, so one of the things that we need, that Ahmed thinks that we need, is the Jenkins instance, um, which lives in the cloud. So how do you do a DD in the cloud, right? And this is where DF Time Wolf really comes in and really shines. Um, DF Time Wolf has a very handy command that does this. It's really unimpressive when shown in the command line because it's just like a bunch of lines that are output, but this is way clearer. So in green, you see the Greendale's IoT project and in blue, it's CFA's incident response project. So these are two separate Google projects. Time Wolf is gonna ask the Greendale IoT cloud project to please copy the disk for Jenkins. The disk is gonna automatically be transferred into the incident response project. And this is due to a library that Time Wolf uses called LibCloud Forensics that does all the dance and magic, which somehow sometimes can be quite involved. Then there's another API call to Turbinia saying like, hey, please forensicate disk Jenkins copy. Turbinia does its magic. It creates a plot file out of the, out of the disk and it sends it back to TimeWolf, which in turn can then send it to uh, TimeSketch in the same server, in the same project. So this is basically what happens. And also what they need is they would like a copy of uh, the, the, the B Chang's computer. So we use something called a GIF stick, which is basically a USB stick that you can see right here that will just boot a computer in forensics mode. And once the computer is booted, you just have to click on an icon called forensicate and, every, and it will do all the magic and it will upload the, the disk binary image to the cloud for processing by Turbinia or by any other sense that you have. So you can see the icon here. It's also, again, not a super impressive demo. You see a bunch of stuff happening. Uh, but the idea is this is just another way to upload a forensics, a physical machine's disk image to the cloud instead of just uploading a virtual machine's disk image to the cloud. So what happened so far? What do we know? Uh, some instances were created and started mining cryptocurrency, and this is what alerted Ben. And while digging, Rosa found some other unrelated to a strange activity. It's unrelated from the mining, but it's still quite strange. And she decided to dig a bit deeper. Uh, so Ali is asking a question, how does it handle encrypted disks? Um, you would have to decrypt them manually uh, in that case, um, or you can provide the key to the disk. And if it's like preset um, or known encryption scheme, it can decrypt it for you. Uh, but otherwise you would have to unlock the disk first. I assume you're talking about GIFT and not what happens in the um, in the cloud. There's also encryption in the cloud, which uh, is handled in different ways. Um, so we decided to uh, Rosa decided to dig deeper. Uh, and what what the evidence that we have so far is API logs from cloud. We have the Jenkins VM disk timeline that was used uh, that was obtained DF TimeWolf, uh, and we have Ben's workstation timeline that was gifted. Um, to CFA. So what happens if we work uh, backwards? Let's use TimeSketch instead of the screenshots. Um, TimeSketch has a very handy thing where you can use saved views. So it's very handy for demos, of course, but it's also pretty handy in a shared investigation with someone else because you can bookmark uh, basically views over your data. So in this case, I'm like, well, okay, let me bookmark this. So it will bookmark my prefetch base and it will also mark uh, the date and time that I want to focus on. So what basically happens here is Rose is focusing on events that happened before the time here, before these set metadata and reset events that we showed um, were happened. So what she sees, and this is pretty another cool feature of time sketch is that you can see that the two timelines you have in green, you have the timeline that happened that um, Ben's laptop produced, and then you have the timeline that the stack driver logs produce. And these are completely merged and intertwined. So in the same view, you can see what the events that happened uh, over time. And this is pretty useful in this case, because you can see that you know, a few minutes before we see the set metadata actions, 
we also see that some weird things are going on in Ben's uh, computer. Uh, we see command exe being run. We see nc64.exe being run, which is really weird. Um, we also see this. And if we look a little closer at, so this, this information is obtained from prefetch files on the disk. And prefetch files are a very good source of uh, execution hints on Windows. Um, so if you look at commands, it, ha it also has like a list of map files um, that, that were used here. And we can see that there's this very weird um, file here in app data and vtelemetry.bat. What is that? And also in app data and the Unistore directory, we have nc64.exe. This all looks pretty suspicious uh, if you have. So if we focus on the Unistore directory, um, where is the? It's just we see uh, we see the same command and and nc64, but let's remove this uh, time range. Loading some events. Um, let's have a little more space here. Uh, we already have 400 events. We have a bunch of that files that I kind of polluting our view, so we can remove them from our view, uh, and then we can see a lot of other events that are happening. Uh, and this one is of particular interest. So this is always around the same date, right? This is of particular interest because we can see a run key being set. So this is a pretty common persistence mechanism for uh, malware. And we can also see that it happens in uh, ntuser.bat, which is like the user's personal uh, registry hive. So this does not require advanced privileges. It's pretty stealthy when you're not for it. It doesn't tip off any any um, any extra security alerts to the user. So yeah, uh, at this point, Rosa is um, is really not is starting to freak out, right? So if we go back to um, what we're interested in now is seeing other things that happened around um, around these things. So if we if we want to see, for example, what happened. Um, around the NC64 file system events. So this is precisely, we're selecting things that contain NC64.exe and also Unistore because we are looking for this uh, executable. And this is the data type that we're looking for, which is basically the, um, the file system listing. And so the NTFS parser that we have, which is gonna parse the Windows file system, can just the timestamps, the creation timestamps of, of this file. So if we see here, it was created around this time. Uh, so a bit earlier, a few days earlier than than the actual malicious activity. So what gives, like what, how did, how did it get there? If we look at other things that happened um, around that time. So if we look at file system events and also, you know, Chrome history, pages visited and files downloaded. Um, and we filter on the time that happened here. Um, we can see a bunch of interesting things. Uh, we can see this LNK file being dropped. Uh, we can see uh, more, more of the LNK. Uh, we can see webmail activity. Um, so at this point, we get a pretty clear picture of what's going on. Um, the LNK file, the PDF.LNK file looks really suspicious. If I saw this in a file system, I would pretty much freak out. Um, the good thing is that Plaza, we don't need to recover this file from the disk. We could because we have the disk, uh, but it would be a very manual process. But Plaza has a parser for LNK files and it will extract some information from it. Uh, so I just need to find the thing here. Uh, yep. So just looking for the file name gives us more information about its history. So you can see the whole, um, Webmail, apparently we have a download from the file name here. There, there's a download. So we can see the download came from the webmail. Uh, and this is, you know, very old events. These are events that are in the timeline, but I don't really have a time information. So they just are put at epoch zero. And we can see that the LNK file is actually another base64 uh, script with, you know, all the, all the suspicious flags, like hidden, exec bypass, encoded command, this really doesn't look that good. 
And if we have a look at what the command is, we say, oh, well, this is Python, and it's importing URL lib, and it's executing whatever is obtained from this other URL, again, on the typo squatted domain. So that's really not that great. Um, I'm just looking at the questions that you've been asking, but I see people have been answering them. So that's very good. Very open source uh, of you to do that. So, you know, at this point, CFA goes back to Greendale and is like, all right, Greendale, there's a lot of stuff that we've seen, but we don't really understand why someone would want to compromise uh, Ben's computer so bad. So what we found is uh, there's a metadata change in the instance and a reboot to backdoor it. Around the same time, we found on Ben's computer executions of TMC and D and what looks to see to be uh, lateral movement or exploration with nc64.exe. We found it running a few times. It turns out nc64 is netcat. Um, we pivoted on the creation date of nc64 and we found a phishing email and a suspicious, suspicious PDF LNK file and that linked to a download and execute script. So, you know, these, this is not your regular phishing attempt. It's pre, it points to maybe not advanced, but at least very targeted um, attacks, right? But something's missing and we don't have the full picture. So please, Greendale, tell us what, what is Ben working on that would be so attractive to users, to attackers. And Greendale says, well, you know, Ben is working on our bioreactors. So what, what's a bioreactor? Well, this is a bioreactor. Uh, and why would Ben be working on this? Oh, because he's working on the HVAC systems, so the AC systems that control the temperature in there. Okay, can you tell us more about how it works? So how does it work? Um, developers push code to a Git repo in cloud, and this is again all in the in the um, in the Greendale you know project. So they push up there. Uh, the code gets pushed into a Jenkins continuous integration and development pipeline. So it's just going to build the things continuously. This is then pushed to Kubernetes nodes. Uh, and the Kubernetes nodes are going to control and send commands to the AC units that control the temperature in the bioreactor. So if someone eventually got access to the Jenkins server, that could probably be a problem, right? And what we've seen so far is that the Jenkins server, which is right here, was backdoored in some way. So if we're looking for Git activity, uh, because we want to know if the, the attackers tampered with um, with the code, we can look for events containing Git on the time frame that surrounds the compromise. So this is a pretty big time frame. You probably can't see much. Um, but it's from September 25th to October 5th. So this is pretty big. And we see that October 2nd, there is effectively a uh, Git event that happens, the, a dot .git directory, which is basically means that this is a Git repo, uh, an H, HVAC IoT production. So, so far, this doesn't look really suspicious, but who would clone a Git repo in the app data directory? That sounds quite, uh, quite suspicious to me. So Rosa keeps digging, uh, and she wants to figure out what the latest changes for this was, and she sees so the get index here, um, and there's probably another query that I can do. Um, yep. So let's look at the file system changes. This is file system changes that contain, you know, this path, but does not contain any of the get information because this can be uh, a little noisy. So if we look at this, we see that the latest file that was changed, and this happens, um, you know, a few days after. So there's like a one day difference between the Docker file and the manifest, which this looks like a Git clone. But then a few days later, this is the file that was changed, HVAC server.py. Uh, this is probably really not great. Um, and so if we want to see what was changed um, in the cloud repo, then there's a diff we can do. This is a view of the cloud repo in, um, in the cloud, right? And this is the diff that was changed. So you know, if the time is bigger than this, then we just change the AC on variable uh, and we change it based on the maintenance mode, uh, which defaults to false. And when Rosa look at, looks at the code, she realizes that this data directory, directory never has a maintenance mode set up. So this will always default to false. So this basically means that whenever the time is superior to this, 
um, the AC will be disabled, which you may not want in the case of a bioreactor. Uh, so Rose is American, but she she has seen a few weird date rats before in her life. Uh, but this hex encoding is really not something she's seen before, but she, she doesn't let that scare her and she tries to decode it. And this is in fact, yes, an epoch timestamp. And oh my God, it is June 18, 2020 um, at, you know, 3 p.m. UTC, so just a few hours from now. Um, so yes, she reversed the code. Uh, she gets the information, green, yellow, green, yellow, reverse the code. And, you know, she closes the incident thinking like, ah, this is what the attackers wanted to happen, but it did not happen because, you know, I intervened. So as for Rosa's first engagement, this was a really good success for her. And this, this is the end of our story. Uh, we have a few closing credits and a few notes. So the key takeaways of this, um, is for those who have been, I would usually say for those in the back, but I guess now it's more for those who were not listening or were like watching Twitch streams. Uh, why do we do this in open source? We try very hard to be platform agnostic so that everyone can use it. Not only Google and Googlers and people using Google technology can use it. Uh, in fact, we've been working really hard on having uh, the LibCloud Forensics library that TimeWolf uses to do this cloud forensics magic. We've been trying really hard to port it to other providers like uh, Amazon and Azure. Um, and this is to be expected by the end of September. So the same operations of cloning disks and copying disks in the cloud can also be used on those platforms. Uh, and this is because we never know which environment we're gonna have to work with, right? Uh, Google is a company that buys other companies frequently and maybe some of those companies are not already on GCP, right? So, and maybe we're gonna need to do forensics with them. Um, and we also want to ingest data from non-Google sources. So if, you know, this company we're working with has like logs that we've never seen before, well, we want something that's flexible and that's not tied in to Google. And this has the added benefit that anyone can use these tools uh, for this. Um, so if we can give something back to the community, to the FIR community in the process, then that's also something that we're looking for. Um, so this may seem very daunting, but how do you get started if you want to try this out? Um, most of the platforms that we've seen, they have ready to use Docker containers. Uh, so TimeSketch has one. Uh, we're working on the Trio one. Um, and you can upload, you can manually upload Plaza files to TimeSketch if you want uh, to use it. We also have set up for you today um, a special demo server. So you can log in to the TimeSketch server that I just showed and you can start playing around with it. Don't be afraid of breaking things. The server is going to go away in a week anyways. So you can feel free to comment and star events and everything. It's all good. Um, and we also have a bunch of links for you in the next few slides. So for SETI, security is the project that contained the Terraform script that you saw at the beginning. Um, if you want to set up this uh, infrastructure in GCP, then you can do it. It's Apache license v2, so it's really open and there's like really no, no constraints of use. TimeWolf, which is the orchestration between our different tools. Uh, also, in, on a Git repo, we have Turbinia and Plazo, who are also on their own Git repos. Turbinia is the orchestration in the cloud, and Plazo is something that you can also use on your local computer to process timelines. Uh, and it also has a Docker container, so you don't need to worry about installing dependencies. Uh, Stick, which I see someone has already shared in the chat, but it's also here. Um, we have a demo featuring with our in-house hand model, which is a coworker of mine. Uh, we have TimeSketch uh, that has this demo.timesketch.org um, server that I think. I think this one is down right now, but I will share with you the link to the actual TimeSketch server that we spun up for this uh, presentation. Uh, there's also a, a Google group that you can email. Uh, so, and here is like the whole slides with all the information. We have a Slack channel that you can join if you have any questions on those tools. Uh, we're pretty reactive uh, on it, and there's a lot of people that can help. Uh, and we also have a blog uh, that is fairly new. We've been uh, feeding it pretty often as of late. Um, so feel free to check it out if you're interested in knowing what the future of these tools are. But that's a bunch of open source tools that maybe have a place in your ecosystem, uh, hopefully. So feel free to use them, send us your feedback, open issues. Uh, come yell at, yell at us in the Slack channel uh, and it's all good. And because this is a story we have, you know, closing credits uh, of everyone who worked on the presentation. So thanks very much everyone for listening. I hope this was as interactive as possible. It's the first time I'm doing a demo 
And also the first time I do one of these uh, online presentations, so I hope it was good. Uh, and if you have any questions, I will keep an eye on the chat. Um, so yeah, have at it. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. It was great seeing you doing uh, forensic in, in, in real time with these tools. Yeah, yeah. Well, yes. It was it was a little bit cheating because you know the answers came pretty quickly, but <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. But yeah. in fact, I've I've missed uh, a question uh, about time sketch. Yeah. Uh, so the question is, I guess you have finally answered. But uh, so time time sketch will collect and pass all evidence of execution, prefetch, aim catch, etc. So. Time sketch's job is not really to collect and parse. Time sketch is just there to show you what you can do. Um, and what I showed here was just some very basic querying, but it also has uh, a few analyzers. Maybe maybe they have been activated, and I can show you the results of one of those. Um, let's see if we have the first query I had, which was the one on the instances. So all this. Collection is done DF TimeWolf. The parsing of the data is done by Plazo. Plazo is really our mega parser that parses any kind of uh, file that you can imagine, or the ones at least that contain useful forensics information. Um, and typically, a file system, as far as Plazo is concerned, is a thing that it can parse. So it's going to go through the file system. It's going to go through each file. And if the file contains useful metadata, like a prefetch contains, a lot of good metadata on you know the what was executed and when. So it's also to parse that, that out. If it finds a zip file, it's gonna get into the zip file and find and parse also the contents of the zip file. If it finds a picture, it's gonna parse exit metadata and so on. Um, so time sketch is just a pretty way of displaying the output of Plazo instead of using a text file, which Plazo has. Uh, it's just gonna use uh, a nicer interface where you can do maybe faster queries. Um, but what's pretty good about about time sketch is that you can do some more advanced analytics on your timeline. So if you see here, there's like a GC instance created tag, and this comes from one of the analyzers that we have on our timeline um, that is going to look for probably you know this uh, insert uh, statement, and it's going to tag events uh, with this. So if I look at tag GC instance created, we see all the events that have this tag, right? Uh, and so that's pretty useful because you can build any analyzers that you want. Analyzers are written in Python, and they go over your timeline, and there's pretty advanced things you can do. We're currently working on a Sigma analyzer, so hopefully something that can ingest Sigma rules. Uh, and then based on the Sigma rules that you have, build Elasticsearch queries that will match events. And if these events are matched and found, then you can tag these events with whatever Sigma rule you're in. So from my experience, I have a question here. From my experience, how well does it scale with large projects with a lot of logs? Well, you know, the one, one of the mantras when you work at Google is basically everything that you do has to scale. And when we talk about Google scale, it's it's a pretty big scale. So this works pretty well with very big amounts of logs. I think the biggest investigation that we've done was with a few dozens of uh, disk timelines on there. Um, of course, it won't work as well if you have uh, a low performance server. Uh, in this case, our servers are pretty performant, and we also have Elasticsearch set up with shards and everything. So uh, it requires a bit of tweaking if you want to scale it. Uh, but otherwise, it scales pretty well with very big amounts of data. Uh, if you look at this single um, single timeline, you see this one has 2 million events. Uh, we've had sketches that have even more events than that. Um, I don't want to give you I don't want to give you fake numbers, but if you had, you know, this this is the file system timeline for one disk. So if you have like ten disks, you have 20, 20 million events very easily. Um, so it scales it scales really well. That's what that's exactly why we had to build uh, a service that did this instead of using less and grep and awk. 
Uh, Davey, did I answer your question about parsing and time sketch? Yeah, 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 yeah. Perfect. Okay. Cool. Okay, so if we don't have any any other question, um, thank you, thank you again, Tama. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah.